Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to a, a, the first edition of the Rock Pile Report draft preview series. We're here tonight talking about linebackers. Joining us is the, uh, I, I almost want to put this in quotes like it's a formal title, the just speaking to Mina Kimes, EJ Snyder from Bootleg Football. <laughs> um, oh, man. E- EJ, what's it like now that you no longer have to deal with us commoners on a regular basis and you get to rub elbows with smart people? Hey, I, you know, I think commoners are smart people because I'm a commoner, and if commoners aren't smart people, then no, we don't want to go there. Anyways, uh, and, you know, smart people tell me things like, hey, Montucky cold snacks are yes! good. Look at that. So, yeah. no, I, I knew that before you guys got sponsored. It was just a happy accident. But, no, we have matching beers. We're here to talk about football. Like, we're all smart people. Like, obviously. <laughs> Obvi- I-, I love how he says obviously, Chris. Like obviously. your haircut and my teeth. Like, yeah. yeah, obviously those men are intelligent. <laughs> Guys, we're here tonight. We're g- we're going to be talking about the linebacker class. But before we do, I want to give EJ just a minute to pat himself in the back. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what bootleg football has? Because this is like your season. Like the the regular season, you guys do a great show. You do a great job dissecting all of the ins and outs of the NFL season, reacting to action, trades, things that are going on in real time. But the draft, I think, is kind of the pre-draft process is something that you and Brett kind of bonded over at the beginning of your relationship, right? Absolutely true. We met at the Senior Bowl in 2020. So, you know, bootleg was indeed born in the pre-draft process. It's something that both of us really sort of hold uh, deeply and dearly because it is the foundation of the league. Like, these are the players that will make up the NFL for the next, you know, however many seasons and getting to know them as collegians and, and doing that projection of whether or not a good college player will become a good pro player, something we have a lot of fascination about. And it is just endlessly interesting, I think to both of us. So yeah, it is a season where we do a lot of work. We have a lot of great guests. Um, we get to interview a lot of these prospects now, which is weird. We're moving into this, uh, you, you mentioned it a little bit, sort of access phase of our career where people are saying, well, you should be there, aren't you? And we say, no, but we'd like to. And they're like, we'll make that happen. And we're like, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we're there's a very strong possibility we're going to be going to Elite 11. Uh, I got... A, a sort of pseudo invitation to TEU the other day, which just kind of came out of thin air. I was like, uh, yeah, they're like, you, you don't go to that. I was like, I don't know anybody that goes to that. <laughs> like I would love to. Um, we ran into Duke when we were down at the Shrine Bowl. Duke had famously never like responded to any of our <laughs> like tweets or anything. And he did while we were in Dallas. And then I literally ran into him on the sideline and uh, I was like, oh, hey, Duke. And I introduced myself, EJ Snyder, but like football. And I shook his hand. I swear to God, Duke is a very solid human being. Shook my hand very firmly, looked me dead in the eye and said, I know who you are. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's great or terrible. Um, <laughs> like, but, you know, very strong possibility that we'll end up at OL Masterminds at some point. So it's this weird thing that we didn't set out to do, but. You know, we ended up on the field combine. Uh, we're going to be going to a bunch of these events. And it is really interesting now to be involved in this process in a, in a different way with a different level of access. And um, it has both new opportunities and new pitfalls. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you guys are definitely busier now. Your, yes. your personal lives are much, much busier, but better for it. And I, I can't wait to hear the latest thing you just taped with Mina Kimes. I did the last spot you guys did with her was awesome. I did. In fact, most of the stuff you guys have put out over the last few weeks has been pretty good. Do you want to tease some of the stuff you have coming up before we really dig into this? Sure. Uh, so we did our quarterbacks episode with JT O'Sullivan. Last time I checked, that was about 60,000 views. Uh, since then, <laughs> we've recorded with both the Matts, Matt Bowen and Matt Harmon. So Bowen for some of his favorite players in this draft. Matt Harmon, obviously, for wide receivers in this draft. Uh, just taped with Mina. Uh, As soon as I get back from my trip this weekend, we've got, uh, geez, Daniel Jeremiah on Monday, Emery Hunt, Brandon Thorne. Uh, I'm forgetting at least three people because the schedule is pretty much full. Apparently, we're doing a crossover draft again with the uh, NFL Stock Exchange guys, Trevor Nice, uh, Connor. Uh, We did that last year, and it, it went 
famously. They've done it with a bunch of other folks, but uh, Trevor said to me, well, don't, don't tell anybody. So, you know, nobody here is really listening. <laughs> you you were our favorites and everybody asked for you. So you have to come back. And I was like, all right, we're, we're in. We have a great time. We know both those guys. So it's, it's going to be a sprint to the finish. We are literally shoving things, time slots into places where people normally don't record because we're just like, whatever, that's where it fits. Let's do it. It's I, worth it. So I'm so excited. Guys, well, it also not- helps that. Brett conveniently booked a trip to Ireland like a week and a half before the draft. So, are you Letter Kenny fans? Oh yeah. To be fair, to, to be fair, Brett did not book a trip to Ireland. Brett is going on a trip to Ireland. <laughs> so, is, is we can point. Just, da, 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 da. We'll just let that be what it is. We'll have to ask him Brett about that later on. Trip to Ireland. Brett is going on a trip to Ireland, and yes, uh, you know, I'm like I said, I'm leaving tonight to go on a trip to to Austin for four days, and I'll be back. So we're just at this point when somebody reaches out and says yes, but I can only do it at you know we're like don't care mm-hmm. six a.m. eleven p.m. doesn't matter. We're recording all the time. Let's do it because we love bringing all the content and our poor editors. I, a shout out to our editors. They are just like we're just shoveling stuff at them. <laughs> we have Shrine Bowl interviews. We have like four of them every day. We're like, oh, here's Matt. Here's the other Matt. Here's Mina. Oh, by the way, next week you're getting. And they're just like, oh, okay, all right, neat. And we're like, yeah, it's gonna go this way till the end of April, and then we'll buy you all something very nice because <laughs> they are working extremely hard right now to get all this content out because we're recording it. You can imagine what it takes to process and put out on the back end. So they're doing a, a yeoman's job all of them. Yeah, I know how that goes. Yeah, Chris is our workhorse <laughs> over here. I'm Chris just, is like, yeah, I'm just, understood. I'm just a gorilla behind the microphone who gets to show up and drink and have a good time with all this. So with that said, guys, make sure you're following on YouTube, on Twitter, Bootleg Football. Make sure you're following EJ. Make sure you're following Brett. It's it, You'll be smarter for it. I know I am. And so with that, here's a toast to all your successes. Chris's cocktail of the week. Now, Chris, this is obviously a bourbon-forward item. It's... Uh, Brown in color. It's got a giant rock floating in it, as Chris often does. It's well, got a. I'm not gonna. You don't. No ex- citrus scent to this. You don't need to guess it because every cocktail here up until the draft is based on who is on the show. So okay. we have. Uh oh. EJ on the show. So we are doing old fashions through and through to the draft. So EJ, this one I've is- heard. I've heard. Woodenville's close by you. We have Wooden, yes, it's very true. Woodenville private select single barrel, so it's like 115 nice. proof. Uh, yep. Wood bitters, walnut bitters. I've heard walnuts are big up in your uh, area of the country. It's, That's what Google told me. That's what Google I mean, tells me. Google also <laughs> told me that cherries were a big deal, and then cherries are big. Uh, sure. The last thing that I've heard. Uh, because it's smoked with apple chips. I've heard oh, apples. Oh, yeah. Apples are Absolutely. a big deal. Well, and also apple he's orchards, a giant and he's a big barbecue fan. Part of the state. So the fact that you smoked it, I mean, I I could tell you what, a smoky cocktail with Woodenville, anything you put in it there, I guarantee EJ EJ wouldn't say no. I, I would absolutely try it. It sounds like a very interesting mix of flavors and I'm just kind of uh, I'm pleasantly taken aback that there is a Drink that was fashioned with my geographical preferences in mind. I'm not gonna lie to you, sir. It the wood bitters were a bit jarring at first sip, but <laughs> but now when no no, but when it because you figure it's smoked, you're getting sure. this because it's not just the nuttiness from the walnut bitters. It's like a I don't even know how to describe it. That's why I said it was like jarring. You're like, what is that flavor? But it's not offensive. Yeah. I just don't recognize it. That's that's pretty good, Chris. You should send him the so, recipe for that. Write it down. Shoot bait- it over to him. Basically, it sounds like you ground up a leftover fruit orchard and filtered bourbon through it. <laughs> well, there's there's something in my bar called Wood Bitters. I don't know that, what yeah. that means. I like how he acts like he didn't it, buy it. It's just oh, in I my did. Bar. Yeah, oh, and then I there. then I have black walnut bitters, a dash of yeah, each of those, sure. simple syrup. I used a because uh, I went to the grocery store and I couldn't find cherries. I guess they're not mm-hmm. out in this neck of the woods yet. Yeah, a little early for you guys. Couldn't, get, I was going to do a cherry syrup, so I did just a standard simple syrup with a bar spoon of the cherry juice in one of my jars of uh, 
maraschino oh, so did, cherries. Like, maraschino cherries. Yes. Okay. He, he's right. a regular Boy Scout over here. He's a regular Boy Scout. He's, he's being creative. Now, I'm impressed. the funny thing about this cocktail, and it kind of makes for a nice segue into the Bills linebacker situation and well, the upshot for the draft, is that it's one of those things where the individual parts <laughs> and then <laughs> the sum that they can create. Oh, boy. It, there's, there's a lot of, like, like, this is a giant unknown. When Chris is creating this cocktail, he says, well, I know this is good. I know that's good. I know this is good. I think I know what this is. I don't know what this is, but I have an idea it might be good. And if I put them all in a glass, it's obviously going to make a fantastic cocktail. And yet my first reaction to this was probably not what he was expecting. And and so in that way, the sum of the whole may not be at the same level of all of its parts. And I think that that's what you get out of the Bills linebacker position if you look at it today, where we sit right here on April 3rd. You know, earlier this week, we aired a podcast talking about how the Bills roster from this year doesn't necessarily have to be worse, in quotes, mm-hmm. than last year, even though we've undergone a lot of changes. And obviously, that got a giant syringe full of steroids, you know, some DECA, <laughs> some D-ball pumped into it after the trade of Stefan Diggs. Like, that dynamic gets skewed a little bit farther. But at the same time, you take a look at what we had at the linebacker position, and that's one of the things I'm hanging my head on when I say things don't have to be worse. You Mm -hmm. could have made some improvements with some schematic things you could do differently that might bear fruit. You're returning a pair of Pro Bowl caliber starting inside line, interior linebackers, both of whom probably size-wise would naturally project to a weak side linebacker. Like, Do you think that that's fair? Terrell Bernard is a little small for a middle linebacker, correct? Uh, you know, it's tough to say that anymore. Like five years ago, hundred percent. Okay. Yes. Now, like there are so many of them around the league and that one is, um, it's persistent. It's sticky. That idea that, a that an inside linebacker has to be two thirty five or that's not the position he should be playing is pretty outdated. Uh, it's been a while since, you know, the average weight of an inside linebacker was that high. There are guys that play at that weight, but what people don't realize, uh, and this, I was reminded of this when Aaron Donald retired and said, Oh yeah, I played an entire season when I kicked everybody's ass at 265." And everybody was like, what? And I'm like, do you realize that Shaq Leonard during his like all pro seasons played at like 280? Mm-hmm. which means during the middle of the season, he was probably like 212 yeah. because nobody can keep weight on during the season. So the idea that he's small, he's smaller than they used to be, but I would say he's average size for middle linebackers these days. Okay. So then behind him, you've got third round pick Dorian Williams, who really wasn't allowed to see the field much last year. Mm-hmm. You know, he got a couple spots here and there, but nothing. His workload was very minuscule. You've got veteran Nick Morrow, who once <laughs> upon a time, when he was a free agent, I want to say, it, it, you had to go back years and years. I remember trying to talk myself into him in free agency and being like, no, this guy would be a fit. He does this and he does that and statistically this. And it's another one of those things where sometimes analytics just make you look like a boob. And that's okay, because your numbers and tape and all these things are just they give you an idea. It doesn't mean you're going to be right or wrong. You just use it as like a guideline for decision making, or at least you should be if you're a smart football individual. Nick Morrow is now making practice squad dollars here, so it's not a prohibitive contract. He's Mm -hmm. not being paid as someone who is expected to be a sizable contributor to the team, should it not fall that way. But he's got NFL experience more so than what we had last year. He's got better athleticism than the individual in Tyrell Dodson that he replaced, he was also cheaper than Tyrell Dodson ended up being, which I think probably had more to do with it. And then you've got Bale Inspector, a guy who, interesting, seventh-round pick, great special teams contributor, actually got into some game action this year and looked, you know, outside of the, he missed a massive chunk of the year due to injury. But yep. when he did play, he at least looked like he wasn't a liability against the run. He seemed to process and diagnose well, trigger quickly, come downhill, make a play. Fine, you know, he had a couple tackles for, I think he had at least one I remember being a highlight tackle for loss, but he was just sound. Now, in pass coverage, I don't know what he'd be because he didn't spend enough time on the field. Sure. That's a really sound room, depending on what you think of Dorian Williams and Nick Morrow. 
And that's why sure. I want to talk to you about this because Dorian Williams might be the most interesting piece of this in terms of what the Bills may or may not have to do in this year's class with or with the players that we're about to talk about. What did you think about him when you were evaluating Dorian Williams? I liked him coming out. He's got good mobility. He's decent underneath versus the pass, and I think this is an important distinction to make with all players, with nickel corners, with safeties, with linebackers, anybody that's, you know, everybody has to defend the pass. Now, where are they good against the pass? Because very rarely can you just say a player is, quote-unquote, good against the pass. Well, good where? Where are their limitations? Williams plays very well between the numbers against the pass and out to about 10 or 12 yards. He has some pass coverage ability. I would not say that's deep against fast slot receivers, not a matchup anybody wants to see. And I would not say it's, you know, great on outbreaking routes against guys with a little bit more speed, those classic wide tight ends, you know, that have a little bit more wheel to them. But he hits like a ton of bricks. He diagnoses quickly. You mentioned that about Bale Inspector as well. I like Dorian Williams. He was one of the inside linebackers last year that I thought, huh, this guy could get in the league and play pretty well, pretty quickly, and then maybe develop. You know, you look at guys like Nick Bolton, who I, you know, was not a fan of of up high as he was taken. (laughs) I thought he was a great run defender, super tough, but he was not good against the pass. Like, let's not do historical fiction. When he was in college, he was not a great pass defender. He has developed significantly over the last two years and made himself into a much more complete player. Now, that's a credit to the Kansas City coaching staff. It's a credit to the player for taking that coaching and and developing. Um, So it it is possible for players who have those limitations to exceed them, right? That's that's the ideal. Dorian Williams has a really nice base and I think a better balance than a player like Nick Bolton. His work against the run was not as high as Nick's, but his work against the pass was significantly better. So I think Dorian Williams is good. And you said what the Bills have to do. It's interesting because, again, as you're counting on health, and we know what happened with the Bills linebackers last year and counting on health. If Matt Milano's there, this is a null and void issue. Like you, mm-hmm. You're not talking about this. If Milano goes down with injury like he did last year, it's a front and center issue, and all of a sudden everybody's worried about it. And that's the same with every position on the team. Sure. So in terms of have to, I don't know that they have to if they're counting on health. If they want better depth, yeah, there's some question marks there. Because like Balin, interestingly enough, we interviewed at Shrine. I want to talk about access. We didn't really uh, mean to. And this is, you know, <laughs> this isn't talking out of school. Like the way it used to work uh, up until this last year was uh, a position group from one side or the other. They do a uh, East and West or North and South. I forget how they designate it geographically. And they say, okay, this group is, you know, West uh, linebackers and edge rushers. And you're like, okay. And so you look through your list and you go, who do we have that we want to see in that group? And sometimes there's a ton and you're not going to get them all in because you get an hour with each position group and usually takes us about 12, 15 minutes to do an interview. So the most we're going to get is four. We typically only get two or three. And, you know, it was one of those where there weren't that many guys in his position group that we wanted to see. And we did two. And we're like, oh, who's that? And we're like, oh, that's the dude from Clemson. We should go. We should go check that out. (laughs) You know, so he was our third interview of the hour. And he's a fascinating guy. He's really smart football wise. He sees the game really well. Um, He was a better testing athlete than I think he is on the field. That doesn't always show up, but he's, you know, he tested very well. I think his RAS was like nine. Uh, 919 or something mm-hmm. like he was he was a good player athletically um, didn't always show up and again he struggled with some injuries at Clemson he played most of his senior season with a big club on his hand um, so you didn't get to see everything and but fascinating player that again we weren't going to spend a bunch of time with but now here it comes on the backside we've got a little bit of insight about who he is he is one of those players I think can develop he's got to stay healthy he's got to stay on the field and again I'm not sure that all the athleticism that showed up in testing uh, shows up on Sundays. Not a bad backup. I don't think if somebody goes down, he is a player you would project into the lineup and say, boy, that guy's going to be really hard to displace. Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm hearing, and it's kind of what I've assumed, because it's kind of like the the con- conversation we're going to have to have with uh, Matt Waldman, who we're going to be talking to here about running backs. It's yeah, I'll say I, hi to Matt. I love Matt. He's one of my favorites. Dude, he, we, we joke that he's the Duke Silver of uh, draft podcasting because <laughs> he plays saxophone and has this Barry White kind of baritone thing oh, going on. He's, he's, he's hilarious. And 
So the, the idea is the bills have all of these glaring needs. You know, the high dollar, high, you know, the, the, these are the, uh, the silver Correct. tuna of needs. Wide yes. receiver, pass rusher. Uh-huh. They're just too large to really justify t- a top pick at those positions. You're not going to invest that in a linebacker or a running back. Correct. So instead, what you're going to do is try to figure out what to do with the back end of the roster and what's available in the middle rounds. Because realistically, as you just talked about injuries, Matt Milano hasn't played a full season in the NFL as a Buffalo Bill. Like we've made the playoffs every year that he's been a starter, I think except for 2018, but he got his leg broken at the end of 2018, I believe. He didn't finish that season. He's missed at least a game or two. Sure. And unfortunately, this past year, he missed most of the season. Terrell Bernard missed the stretch of the season, and it was it's tough. It's tough that it happens in a game right before you're about to play the Chiefs, and you're like, oh, no. Can he figure yeah. it out? Can we get there? Can we patchwork this? To-? And you couldn't, and you paid for it. It, and it cost yeah. us our season. With both recency bias of that yes. experience of what happened to us at the end of the season – and seeing what we have in the cupboard and saying, Spectre's a nice piece. Jordan Williams might be a nice piece, but that's a projection. We don't know. Sure. Is it worth investing in these middle rounds, considering how many picks we have, into some of these linebackers? And that's where getting to know the linebacker class, to me, is interesting. Because I look at this, and the first thing I see is that when I'm looking at other people's big boards and the way some of these pundits, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think mock drafts are... I refuse to do one, and at the same time, I I don't want to take anybody else's fun away. I will just laugh at it quietly on my own. It's almost like uh, it's like when you, Chris. It's like when I see you putting wax in your hair. I go, listen. I'll make a few jokes here and there, but I'm not going to try to stop you from doing it if that's what makes you happy. Mock drafts are the same thing. They're just vanity projects. There is no consensus lock linebacker in the first round, or at least a traditional inside linebacker. Is that weird no. for you looking at this class compared to it's most? It's not because of the recent trend. You talked about a recency bias in the NFL of devaluing that position. There are several positions that are on the way down. Inside linebacker is one of them. Uh, strangely enough, if you have a really, really good superstar one, it's great and it helps, but it's not a position you quote unquote need to ascend to the NFL top of the NFL hierarchy. So it doesn't really surprise me. There are some good players, but it's very thin at the top. Uh, again, you mentioned we just recorded with Mina Kimes. One of the questions I asked her, the strengths of this class and the weaknesses, pretty much universally when you ask folks that follow the draft what the weakness of this class is, it's inside linebacker. That doesn't mean there are no good inside linebackers. That means there are three or four at the top who have that sort of all-arounder potential Again, probably no first-round players there, but my guess is a couple in the second round, one top of the third round, very, very likely. And then there's a drop-off. Then there's a shelf, and that shelf is, I think, you'll get some things, but the range of skills narrows pretty quickly after that third or fourth linebacker. Yeah, um, You'll get guys who can do one thing pretty well, but if they venture outside of that cone, it drops off precipitously. Um I think in terms of the all-arounders at the top, those top three or four guys that Jeremiah Trotter Jr. for me is the sort of jumping off point from, you know, depending on how you see him, of the more complete linebackers to the, okay, now what flavor am I picking? Because that's what I need in my room. I need a better pass coverage guy or I need a thumper or I need whatever. Um, So he's kind of the marker in this class for me after he goes off the board. It's really, I think there'll be another sort of gap where people wait before they pick those linebackers in the middle of the round. But down the board, there are a bunch of guys I like. And this is this is what you brought me on for. Yes. These are the guys. This, this is, is the, the stuff I'm main interested in. list that you want. That a, a little bit later on in this draft, some guys that have shown some flashes and guys that have been in this category for me in previous years have been guys like Dre Greenlaw. Like Dre Greenlaw was not a high pick. And I liked some of the things he he showed in college and said, hey, if he goes to the right place, he went to an ideal place and continues to develop, he could become Dre Greenlaw, <laughs> as we know now, the 49er. Um, so I'm not saying these guys are Dre Greenlaw. I'm saying they've shown some similar flashes that, again, down the board, middle rounds, probably fourth and later, 
these are interesting guys that I want to keep an eye on. Tommy Eichenberg from Ohio State. He could go at the back end of the third in the compensatory picks, but I really think he's probably a top of day three pick. Cedric Gray from UNC. I can't quit him. I saw him pretty early in the process, and I like him. And a bunch of people were really low on him. He, if again, you're talking about those consensus boards, and mm-hmm. he was down in like the one. 80s the 170s for a long time and just recently in the last two to three weeks post combine he's he's starting to creep up into the hey if i need to get a linebacker and i'm not getting one of those top three or four like cedar gray is probably the next tier so he's creeping up into like the 130 range which i think is uh, i would say that's his value leveling out where it should be Mm -hmm. um jalen ford from texas really good hands for an inside linebacker you watch jalen ford's tape and he gets a bunch of picks. And he these are not just balls falling out of the sky that he catches like corn. He grabs them in low pass coverage. And Well, so this again, is a dynamic that I think is important to Bills fans. Because when you think about what the structure of the Buffalo Bills defense is, Chris, one of the things right. that has been our hallmark since Sean McDermott got here is that he relies on safeties in the box. Like, he has to have good safety play. He Correct. finds that when his defense is at its best, he has... And it's not good in terms of athleticism. It's always good in terms of does that player know where he needs to be and can he get to his spot? Because the structure of the defense is actually more important than the individual player making a play in that moment. And so then when you think about the departure of all of our safeties, you go, okay, well, what can we supplement this with? Well, good coverage linebackers are going to be at a premium then because you still have to fill that coverage role in the box, you know, inside that 10 to 12. Who are, I mean, the, the guy you're talking about right now, that sounds like something the Bills might be tickled by or might take a second look at that kind of film. Absolutely. And he is going to be a guy up the board. We're going to have one at the end of the list because I anticipated your question. See, you <laughs> said you're just a gorilla behind the mic. <laughs> Not true. Not true. So Jalen Ford, really interesting player out of Texas. And then Trevin Wallace is the guy down the board who just, I just want the athleticism in my linebacker room. Like, he is not necessarily a well-rounded or complete player. He is an explosive player. And he does make plays on tape. He misses some, too. But he has things you can't coach. And he is way down in, like, the 220s, 230s right now. He is a guy you're taking a flyer on in the late rounds and going, hey, I think I can fix the issues of him being in the right place at the right time because have you seen the explosion? (laughs) Well, and that's it. Like, this is a franchise that prides itself on, I mean, you look at who makes up our roster. They have Mm -hmm. long gone the way of, and especially now in a year that very much looks like it's out with the old and in with the new, and we're going to start this thing from scratch. Mm. It's this, well, not from scratch. I I just had this discussion with Brett, and he was like, I think it's going to be not a rebuild, but a reload. And I was like, I think it might be a reload, but it's going to be shorter than you think, because they're not far away. No, but their their mo has always been. It's how they landed. It's it's how you end up drafting Josh Allen and Tremaine Edmonds in the same draft class, because your <laughs> attitude is, give me all of the freakish stuff that I can't teach you, and let me teach you how to be what I want you to be. And late in the game, be looking for Trevin Wallace because of that. But the guy that I want to highlight to you is a guy from right up the road. I was just at his pro day, and super late. And I mean, this could be a last. 20 picks of the draft type of guy. Okay. But again, he has a narrow cone, and the narrow cone is pass coverage, specifically pass coverage in zone. And he was literally one of the best, best pass coverage linebackers in zone in the entire country in all of college football last year. And he's still going to be picked down at like 240, 250 because, oh, yeah, there's other things in this game that are holes, but that's not one of them. And it's Edifuan Ulufosio out of Washington, and he is going to be in probably the 250s. But, man, if you want a coverage linebacker that you can steal late in the draft, Ulufosio is a guy you want. He moves extremely well. His eyes are in the right place. So all the things you said about McDermott's defense, like he did those for the Washington defense – he made plays that way. He is not a guy that's going to come up for the most part and fill gaps. He can chase to the edges. He does have some speed, but man, it is all about smarts, positioning, and just, I'm just going to call it feel savvy in zone pass coverage for Lufosio. And if you need that, if that's something you want in your linebackers, he's going to be available. You're not going to have to spend a high pick on him. Six foot 236. 
four five forty. I mean, their safety's running those numbers. For a guy yeah. who loves a cover three, you could do a lot worse with a piece like that. That if he never amounts to anything, he's on your practice squad for the first year, and nobody cares. No one's stealing. Yeah, he's a great probably. special teamer. Like because he runs and he's got size. Like go for it. And you can maybe round that into something. I actually like the idea mm-hmm. of that. Now, I like the philosophy and I like some of the names and that's good because it gives us people to dig into as this draft process gets underway and the average fan starts digging into these, but there's a dynamic that I wanted to talk to you about. And it's interesting. I think you're probably the most pragmatic person to try to have this conversation with. If you go back to my dad, <laughs> you're in NFL, deep trouble. If that's yeah. the case, <laughs> if you go back to my dad's NFL, we're talking the eighties, oh. early nineties, maybe even the late nineties. It was almost, you 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 would call it a slur if you got called a tweener. Yeah. If so, if you're a linebacker, and some whether it's three four line outside linebacker, you know, regular stand up inside linebacker, if someone called you a tweener, that was offensive <laughs> because it meant that you were of such a, a frame and a build and a weight that nobody really knew whether you were a traditional 4-3 defensive end or whether you should be kicked outside as an outside linebacker or kicked to the middle to play coverage. Right. And so in that way, that's how people just kind of narrowly defined their view of what uh, what these players should be. Sure. And we've seen, Chris, we've seen firsthand what happens. You know, Some of the, the Bills have taken a lot of tweeners over the years <laughs> who didn't pan out. <laughs> And at the same time, when I take a step back and I say, okay, show me the 3-4 outside linebacker class for 2024. And then I go and I go, okay, show me the edge class. Mm -hmm. And on most ranking, like most sites and most pundits, boards, and everything else, they're kind of this thing. If you go, oh, well, they're they're being ranked. The the top guy is only 6'2", 247 in Dallas Turner. Wait a minute. Ten years ago, you would have been cussed at for saying, 20 years ago, they would have called you an idiot for saying he should be the number one guy at that size. And people go, no, you don't understand. He's kind of based on how coaching works now and now how schemes work and the type of players they're looking for. You just said it earlier. You know, Shaq Leonard, how how much did he weigh? Mm-hmm. He's 212 pounds. He, he, he claimed 218, which meant probably 212 at some point during the season, and people would be aghast at that like all pro linebacker playing near 210 what but it's very true because technique has improved technique has changed the game is played the play is game it's the game is played at a faster pace there's there's Mm -hmm. more velocity to it you want faster pass rushers if that's what your defensive scheme calls for you know you've got different archetypes i actually did a deep dive about this one year where it was that the kansas city chiefs like they were talking about why they can't beat joe burrow they're like, why are we mm. having such a problem with Joe Burrow? And what they found is that it's because he escapes all their pass rush, even though they paid a bunch of money to the defensive line, because they kind of follow the Bills archetype of big physical ends whose idea is to crush a pocket. You're not winning yeah. with suddenness. You're winning with just physicality, slowly getting mm-hmm. to the thing and then allowing your coverage units to do their do their work or to allow second level blitzes to get home. Now most teams are skewing away from that, and you're finding that these six foot two, two forty seven players, if they're fast and they're athletic enough, and there's enough violence in their hands, you can make them really great pass rushers. Do you agree? And what do you think about this year's class of tweeners? <laughs> it's it's fascinating because we're basically taking three roles, and you and I have had this discussion for the last couple of years about linebackers in terms of. And I think it's just fascinating looking at all those boards and seeing how people label them, right? Because defensive tackle is largely zero to four tech. If if you're talking about alignments, right? That's generally guys. And there's a lot of guys that are now what we would call five techs or four, three defensive ends classics who, you know, could be lumped into that in a sort of Chris Jones movement archetype of, Hey, you're big enough. We can put you inside. You can be a three tech. You could slash, or we can put you outside at five, and you can stand up and set the yeah, you like all that good stuff. So, how do people label the players on their board? DT for me is like zero to four. I still do DE because there are guys that play four through six, more mm-hmm. five and six, who you never want going backwards. 
Like you, you look at their entirety of their college tape and they have 40 pass coverage reps in five years. Right. And yeah. you're like, that's not, he's not a DT. He's 275. He's six, three or six, four, maybe six, five. He's 270. He's 265. He never goes backwards. What is that guy? He's not a defensive tackle. Right. So I don't put him in DT, but I'm not going to put him in my edge rankings because you don't want that guy to pedal ever. Mm-hmm. Right. So he is a DE and it's the, one of the smaller rankings on my board, but I've kept that like stubbornly and somewhat religiously um, because I do think it is a specific role four, five, and six, a little bit better size, heavier hands, hopefully longer arms, ability to set an edge. Like, they're not the sexiest players. Some of them can rush the passer, but we see guys like this in the league all the time. They get paid and have long careers, but, you know, the most sacks they ever get is four in their cleanup, right? They're mm-hmm. not creating a pass rush. You talk about crushing a pocket. You talk <clears> about setting an edge. And then you get back to this, and it's not so much 4-3 or 3-4. Or three, it is, you know, what we used to call outside linebacker, guy that can play from really 6 to 9, if we're talking about techniques, so for the lay Hand people, drop. so for the lay people here, where is that on the field? So six, six is outside, clearly outside the tackles, outside shoulder. Yes. To wide nine, which is damn near the slot. Yeah. <laughs> like Detroit used to run wide nine pass rushers, and they almost weren't on the the short screen when they were focusing on the internal. So you're just people might think, hey, that's a really thin distinction, right? That's like slicing the garlic with a razor blade, but it's not. You find very different athletes. Who move very different ways, although their weight might be within 20 pounds of each other, their height might be within one or two inches of each other, their arm length might be the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and people say, well, how can you determine that? You watch the tape <laughs> and you see, is does this player ever go backwards? Ever, ever, ever. Would you ever want that in the NFL? Or the first time that guy did that, would the opposing offensive coordinator go, wait a minute, they're putting that guy in coverage? Oh, guess what? We're going to ISO him and destroy that because there's no way. He has no business being out there, right? So it's not so much alignment of 3 4 4 3 because that's largely dead. It's gone. Mm-hmm. But are you taking a space player? Can that player go both forward and backward? You talked about the things they need to do well as a pass rusher to win. They got to be quick. Got to have a good first step. They have to have pretty good hands. And, yeah, there's other things they need. But if they don't have those – those are the differentiators where, okay, then you're going to kick inside. And then if you roll in the inside linebacker bunch, when you said tweener, I was fascinated. Is he talking about the overlap between <laughs> what I call defensive end and outside linebacker? Or is he talking about the what I would call overlap between <clears throat> inside linebacker and guys that could rush the passer outside as an edge? Yes. And the, so, the, the, the thing is, it has I a lot it of as different. I number two, co- and not had, number one, because sure. I think two is way more interesting. Yeah. Well, and this is the thing: it has a lot of overlap because you look at this and you say, "Well, here's a player who could, in theory, do some things for me. And he's got size and he's got speed, but at the same time, is he a better fit to be near the line? These types of guys you talk about, I don't want that guy. Like a perfect example that I would talk about is because you know, I'm looking back at the 20 as we're talking here. I'm looking back at the 2021 20, NFL draft. Oh. You, know, you had guys around where we were drafting. Peyton Turner comes off the board. Peyton Turner, big, you know, big D end. It was a guy that I liked. Yeah. And then the Bills take Greg Rousseau. And then the next two picks after him were players that had a little more flash. They were they hmm. were speedier. They were, you know, uh, Odafei away, Joe Tryon. Who now? Both of them have Joinka. changed. All weird that they both changed their names immediately after <laughs> being drafted, and Greg Rousseau didn't. That alone, like if I'm a player who bought their jersey post draft and then they changed it, I'd be like, "What the hell, guys? Come on!" You just get the tape out. <laughs> well, that's what everyone's doing with their. Everyone's doing again with their number fourteen jerseys in Buffalo. Yeah, number for sure. fourteen should be retired. Like we're going to talk recycle. About the- just, <sighs> that that would be the jersey to get. Get a Bills jersey in 14 and put Recycle as the nameplate. And I guess the thing that I look at, though, is you have to look at how those players fit because they all play the same position, defensive end, and yet at the same time they're very different athletes Yes, and their production has been very different. 
Correct. The, <laughs> the production has been very different. Greg Rousseau is a different type of player altogether from those guys. You know, his tackles for loss, his sacks, you, you see the way he produces sacks are a little bit, like the way he produces sacks is different. The fact that he spends more time behind the line of scrimmage, generating more negative running plays, his game is different. <laughs> Hundred percent, and yet he'll. They, those players have utility. But they're smaller; <laughs> they can't set the edge that he does. They're more of a liability against the run. It all comes down to philosophy. I love this thing of you don't want the guy who can like, like Reggie Ragland. Reggie Ragland yeah. was this guy who was. You almost <laughs> wish he was a tweener because I'm the yeah, type sure. of guy who cheered when we drafted him. Alabama yeah. fan. And it turned out he had no place on our team because that's not how that position gets played in a Sean McDermott defense. Yeah. In that way, there's these big physical linebackers, and then there's these smaller guys, and then there's a guy who you go, maybe I can move him like an A.J. Klein to the line sometimes in pass rush, but I'd prefer, yeah. and I'd prefer him playing the run, being around the line, never in coverage. If there was somebody in that, like what I think you you probably used to call it a Sam linebacker, right? Like that would be the best description of it. For when you're moving them outside, yes, they're a Sam. And for what they do the rest of the time, they're a Mike. And again, if you can get one player that embodies both of those in the modern NFL, because you don't need to be as big outside, you need to be a little bit faster inside. Like if you can combine those two, yes, there are players. If we're talking about inside linebacker and really edge or outside linebacker or a more dedicated pass rusher guy playing up on the line, there are a few guys that mush the line in this draft. Okay. The bad news for Bills, bad news Bills, not bad news Bears, is that two of them are up high. They're the first two linebackers in this draft. And that's the reason, because they can do all those other things. They have size, and oh, yeah, when you turn them loose to go get a quarterback, they're pretty damn good at that, too. So that's the reason that Peyton Wilson from NC State and Edger and Cooper, a guy that we interviewed at the Shrine Bowl from Texas A&M, are going to be there because they're wild athletes and they're really good doing a lot of that stuff. Peyton Wilson is ridiculously quick. He's 23, 23 miles an hour recorded in pads on the field this year on GPS. Wow. That's, That's cool. And he's 236. <laughs> so he's like Tyreek Hill fast, but he's 6'3 or 6'4, 236. Like, I, just, I yeah. just go back to Mississippi State and get hit by that like third string <laughs> linebacker at a party. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, that guy rearranged my insides like what I imagine a major car crash would. Yep. Every I, play. I don't know what getting hit by that guy would feel like, but I don't I don't want to know. It's – we talk about this – we've talked several times about this access phase, and that has ended up with us on field level more often for all-star games, pro games. Mm -hmm. And the let me tell you, the first time everybody's – oh, I had, like, row 10 seats. I know what it's like. No, you don't. No, you don't. When you're 10 feet away from it and you have to like jump back so your ankles don't get crushed because those guys come sliding through your area <laughs> at 20 miles an hour after they hit the ground like 15 feet ago, like, and they're that big and they're moving at that speed, you almost can't move fast enough. <laughs> and when they're not sliding, when two of them go head up, which is less common in today's NFL, but not uncommon, if you get an outside linebacker running back and it's outside zone and that guy gets free and he's the one that's you know tasked with stopping him and they both lower their shoulders, it's terrifying. Like I'm not a guy that's easily scared. It is terrifying. There is a piece of you primally that goes, oh, my God, like that that happened right in front of you. The noise, the impact, you see how much you know those guys are sort of flexing and you're like, I don't want to be anywhere near that. <laughs> well, I like, think it that's the a, primal thing about football that appeals to everybody, right? It's that oh, absolutely. Base thing of look at these right warriors who have this away. thing. They have this gear <laughs> mentally that we don't possess, yes. and they have the physicality to do monstrous damage with it. Mm -hmm. I so, fully agree. So those are the guys up high that have a well-rounded skill set that could do both. There's a couple of guys that are, again, less talented, so you're going to get them later on, but still have some of those qualities when you watch mm -hmm. your tape. One I think your listeners have probably heard of because of where you are in the country, Curtis Jacobs from Penn State, mm -hmm. 6'1", 241, but also, hey, he went to Penn State, so he's a ridiculous mutant athlete because mm -hmm. that's what they turn out down in State College. And then the other one, this is the surprise. If people want to dig a little bit more, 
guy named Tyrese Knight out of UTEP, who was a guy that I saw a little bit of tape on early in the process, and I went, okay, he's not going to be in my top 100, 150. I'll get back to him later. And then I saw him again on the field at the combine when we were there. And we started watching him move. And this is one of my favorite things to do, whether I'm watching the combine on TV like I have done every other year or if I ended up on the field like I did this year, is watching those guys move. I care how they test. I care about the speed. I care about the explosion. But when the coaches are out there making them change direction, making them hop up and down off the turf, watching them sort of flow to the ball, which is going to be their job when they get to the NFL. How does that guy move? <laughs> Brett came over to me and said, who is that guy? I said, that's Tyrese Knight. That's the guy I told you about a couple months ago that I thought was quote-unquote interesting. He goes, man, i got to watch more of him when I get home. And he, again, brings some of those skills, ends up playing closer to the line, even though he is quote-unquote a middle linebacker. Mm. Um, but they definitely flexed him out. They used him on the edge. And he's got the skills, the speed, the size to get home. And when he does, it's impressive. <laughs> now, he doesn't do it all the time or he'd be drafted you know, yeah. probably three, four rounds higher than where he's going to get drafted, but it's there. And some coach, uh, we can't be the only ones that saw that. We are not the only ones that saw that. And some coach went, give me that guy. Mm -hmm. Just like a guy like Alex Highsmith, right, three yep. or four years ago, where they were like, hey, he's not going to be a first rounder. He's going to be a third or fourth rounder. Give me that guy. Give me two years and give me that I, guy. I can make something happen with these tools. Correct. So in that way, as we kind of wrap this conversation, I always try to end up with a couple players that are just that I've got an itch for. Because, again, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend that oh, I know I love anything about analyzing. This is my anyway. favorite part. Some of this is SEC bias. Some of it goes back to me <laughs> getting knocked out by a kid named D-Ray. Um, Nathaniel Watson from Mississippi State. Yeah. I think about it and I go, here's a team that's losing pass rushers. You know, I watch a lot of SEC football. His ability sure. to blitz – and come up and make plays in pursuit. Some of them are cleanup, but it doesn't matter because it, it, it a sack you gotta is a make sack. those plays in the NFL too. And when you're making ten of them in 2023 and six the previous year, showing that like he still has chops and he's he's working on them. Mm -hmm. I, I, he may be the old school running back you know, linebacker, I guess, which is kind of a pejorative as we talked about, but old school throwback style linebacker, but. If you have a specific idea for that player and you don't have to spend a ton of draft capital to get him, it could yeah. be something you could work with. What are your thoughts on this guy? Well, I like the frame, 6'2", 233. Uh, the arm length is good, almost 33, like 32 and 7 eighths. Um, and, you know, 159 is the number I really care about. That's his 10-yard split. It's pretty good. It's not great. Uh, but at that size, we're not asking size him to adjusted. run down the field. <laughs> we're right. not asking but, you to go chase a, a wide receiver. Yeah, size adjusted at 233, 159 is pretty darn quick. So he has that burst, 463 overall, which is below the average for linebacker. Uh, a lot of people think linebackers these days have to run 4'6 so they're no good. The average for a linebacker, which again, as we all know, average means middle, 477. So he's below that. He's quicker than that. Um, not the most explosive guy, certainly, as you mentioned, not the most uh, fluid, sort of bendy mm -hmm. guy. Again, in that sort of 30 to 40 degree downhill cone, he's got the speed, he's got the explosion, he's played in the SEC, understands contact, how to shed. Um, interesting, again, limited skill set, so either good or bad news, depending on <laughs> whether you're his agent or you're the Bills, is you can get him later on, right? There's not going to be a fight for his services. Mm -hmm. But no, I like the I like the package, the tools, and certainly we've seen lesser players develop more in the NFL, and that's a good sign. And then there's this guy, we talk about the tweener sort of pass rusher, because uh, there's this thing that I keep thinking about when it comes to linebackers, and I think Yes, it would be nice to find some of these younger, flightier, lighter guys who sure. can do, help with the coverage aspect. We mm -hmm. have enough draft picks. You could address a lot of middle-round needs at a lot of places if your intent is to use all of these picks. And I yeah. look at a guy like Mo Kamara and the first out of Colorado <laughs> State. The first time he uh. stood out to me was that just absolutely epic Colorado, Colorado State game. Like I'll, yep. I'll go back and rewatch that game right now and yep. still have a ball doing it. He was so disruptive on his own that he was kind of at some point single-handedly slowing down the Colorado offense. Oh, yeah. Yep. And it's an interesting debate when you have production over traits. Some guys have yep. traits over production. What's the middle ground you're looking for, and how does that, come, uh, how does that apply to a guy like this? 
full disclosure, I don't care. Yeah. We've talked to him. We interviewed him at Shrine. Uh, we've got an interview actually coming out. I think it's tomorrow because we already got back from the editors. So yes. no, Mo Camara's Mo Camara's coming out. Um, fascinating dude. Uh, because not only did we get to talk to him, but we got to talk to his teammates at Shrine. And whenever we get to interview teammates at Shrine, we ask them about the other player. So we got to interview his uh, tight end a little bit. We got to interview his uh, cornerback. Goes again, Uzium, who I really like, who's a great press man corner. And we're like, what's Mo like? Because on the field, he certainly looks one way, but you've been with him at training table, apartment, you know, practice field. You, you've seen this guy inside out. He goes, no, Mo's Mo. <laughs> one of my favorite <laughs> answers ever. He goes, it doesn't matter what he's doing. That's what you're getting. I don't care if it's study hall or the supermarket or playing video games or you're on the field because he's a captain. For Colorado State. Mm-hmm. He said, Mo is that the whole time. He is all go. He loves football. He's going to bring it. You're going to see that energy in everything he does. It's not different off the field. It's not one of those guys with a switch. And we were like, oh, that's interesting. So we got to talk to Mo. And when you're talking about uh, the measurables, he's not the tallest guy and nope. he doesn't have the longest arms. And he knows that. He happens to be one of the bendiest pass rushers in this class. And bend is a much sought after ability. Really comes down to like ankle flexion and how low you can yep. get and hold speed. Um, turns out that guys with decently long arms, he doesn't have super long arms, but they're not really short, but he's short overall and he knows it. When we talk to the tackles at Tribal, <laughs> See, that's especially the, that the tackles, out. Yep. the tall ones, they hate him. Yep. <laughs> Like they hate defending guys like that because he will get underneath their ability to reach out, even with those very long arms. Mm-hmm. Our tackles always talking about it. squat the butt, stay low, stay in your stance. Even so, he can get under them, and then they have to turn and they have a choice. They can either fall on him or hold him. Yep, and but risk they the ten yards. Hate defending fairly quick guys with bend and long arms on the edge because they'll, they'll tell you flat out like I, that guy's a pain in my ass like he is hard to stop my favorite thing and I'll leave the Mo Camara with this we talked to him we said straight up so you know like you know you've been across the hall talking to NFL teams you know what they're going to say he said oh yeah I know what they're going to say they're going to say I'm shorter and they're going to say I have you know shorter arms and that I don't have all the like I'm not replete with all the elite measurables he's like I know I'm not the tallest. I don't have the longest arms. He looked right at us and said, end of the day, they got to play me. <laughs> I love it. See that? No, we were like, uh, sold, done. done. We love Mo Kamara. We liked him before that. We loved him after that. Can't wait for the interview to come out. Would I put him on my team in the middle rounds? A hundred percent. Perfect. See, this is why I like this because now in a year or so, Chris will get annoyed when he's like, God. He's like, he hates it when, oh, Drew talked, Drew asked specifically about this guy, and it turns out he's good, and God forbid if the I Bills know. I'm sorry, him. Chris. My apologies in advance. If you guys get <laughs> Mo Camara, you're going to love him. The city's going to love him. Like, he's going to give you everything, and he's going to be effective as that third down, third and long, NASCAR package pass rusher on the edge. Tackles are going to hate him, even good ones. Guys with ideal measurables are not going to love playing against him because he's a pain in the ass. <sighs> Kind of like us and our podcast <laughs> and everything. Like we we literally go out of our way to irritate some of our listeners. That's who we are. And like you said, Mo is Mo. I'm me. That's one of our That's claims right. to fame. Is everyone who meets me has to turn around to, at some point to my wife and go, "It's not a shtick." <laughs> yes, yeah, seriously. It's not a shtick. This is just a. This, this is real. <laughs> EJ, I love that you give us your time every single year, and you know during the season, whenever we ask, I love that again. Your it's your schedule's chaos. Where can people follow you on can social we, media? I got one. Oh, I got, got I got one thing. Okay, go ahead. And it's almost I wouldn't say it's a it's a a bone to pick as right. as it is a uh don't read too much into it because one of the highlights that bootleg does is what they do between june and july every week you're getting hour and hour and a half on every team in the nfl and then at the end of the week you get the division wrap up sometime in june or july you're going to hit that afc east show and you're going to talk about our division 
all the moves the Dolphins did, the Jets, whatever oh, yeah. whatever New England's doing, and especially what we did. <laughs> whatever New England's yes. doing. Yes. <laughs> Even with what happened today. Uh-huh. When you do that AFC East show, it's very basic. When it comes to you and Brett and you go, all right, who's going to win the division? Open up the depth chart for every team. Find Josh Allen. That's who wins the division. <laughs> Find Josh Allen. Please don't, Find Josh please Allen. don't allow Brett to pick Miami a third year in a row. <laughs> I, I will do what I can to control Mr. Coleman. It is a fool's errand. To oh, try yeah, you can't. The first part. You can't wrap However, it up. However, Chris, you'll be happy to know that for our own sanity, we have changed the format. <laughs> oh. Yes. I can't wait. So we're going to do... An episode for every team, fear not. We will have 32 episodes, but we ain't having 40 because it trashed us last year. (laughs) Set us up for uh, a death march through the season because there was no break. Um, And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different to sort of kick off the series to to have a bit more of an overview. But we will not have those what was classically the Friday divisional episodes because they were – they were the straw that broke the bootlegs back. Like they, they were the extra little like, wait, we already did four episodes this week. Oh, we have a fifth. Oh yeah. So we're not doing it. However, whenever we make picks early or late, I will keep your sage advice in mind. It's very it's it's very simple. You guys can get it like way into the weeds of how offensive line works, offensive strategy. This is how this is how Nate Hackett runs his offense. Joe Brady first year. (laughs) Very simple when it comes to who's winning the AFC East. Which team has Josh Allen? That's who wins the division. Just keep that in mind. So EJ again, go ahead and plug all of your social handles so everybody knows where to follow you. Absolutely. If you're looking at Twitter or X, whatever you're calling it these days, it's at football EJ. That'll give you notifications to most of the things I'm doing or programs I'm showing up on, like this one. If you're looking for bootleg-specific content, go to YouTube, type in bootleg football. We'll pop right up. Hit subscribe. Hit the notifications. That helps us out. Plus, you won't miss any because, holy crap, is there a lot of it coming um, all the way through the summer. So, like you said, Chris, I very much appreciate the segue uh, into content that we will be transitioning to after the draft, after I get a little bit of sleep. Um, But then we'll be rolling right into the season. Probably going to be at the Hall of Fame game, so we're going to be close to your neck of the woods uh, because, you know, We've got a Texan going in. We've got a bear going in. Texans and bears are playing. Like, yeah, we're probably going to be in Canton early in August. I forgot how early the Hall of Fame game is, but I think it's like August 4th or 9th or something. So, yeah, lots to come. Uh, And then, of course, draft live stream. We didn't even mention that. Talking about every single pick of the NFL draft. I'll be down at Brett's place in L.A. And uh, this is this might set you back a pace, Drew. This is year five. (sighs) Because we, it was one of the first things we did. Like it was, we'd only yeah. been doing this like a month, and we did the first one because Brett said, "Oh, it's your five. I said, "No, it's your four. We just passed our four year anniversary. He said, "Yeah, but the first thing we did was literally every pick in the NFL draft. And I was like, "Oh yeah, it's draft live stream fives." So. And my favorite, still one of my favorite moments, is when Clyde Edwards Hilaire went to the Chiefs. Oh my God! And yeah. seeing his real time reaction, and just being like, "Why did we let them do this to us?" <laughs> he really thought that that and that, that underscores what the draft we is and that's why it's so much fun because in the moment you Agreed. just go with what what it is here's the data we've collected here's what we think we know and then you watch where it falls and that's why i love Absolutely. the process guys this has been a lot of fun but we gotta get the hell out of here i'm drew gear that's chris krueger that's ej center from bootleg football and this has been your rock Pile report <laughs>